Uh, I was here in 2008. I was back in 2009. I was here in 2011 and in 2013 and in 2019. And that shows you what a good memory I've got. I remembered where I wrote it down and went and read it yesterday. <laughs> Uh, I, my memory is not near as good as it once was. I have a problem sometimes of keeping up with places I've been and uh, folks that I'm supposed to know, but I don't. Uh, it's not quite as bad yet as uh, I read that uh, uh, oh, that, that uh, this lady and two women driving through town and uh, she ran a red light and uh, she ran the second red light. That other lady getting terribly nervous. She ran through the third red light and she said, Susie, you've run through three red lights. She said, my Lord, am I driving? Now, I, <laughs> I, I, I may not know where I'm going, you know, but, but I don't drive much anymore, Jane drives. And I appreciate the folks coming all the way to Greenville to get us because I don't trust her driving. She doesn't trust my driving and we're just not, we're not driving that far anymore. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I appreciate their coming and then the privilege of being here uh, to enjoy homecoming with you folks. Let me get it out of the way. If you have not read this book, you ought to read it. It's, uh, it's an autobiography of our 70 years of living on the road, uh, places we've slept and places that we stayed that we couldn't sleep and uh, uh, from the... Anyway, when I was here before, I think it was in 2013, the book was just out, and I spent Sunday night sort of summarizing it, and so a lot of you already have it, but if you don't, I think you, that you would enjoy reading it. I know how easy it is to sleep in church on Sunday morning, and I know how hard it is to stay awake. At least I heard of this guy who asked his friends, said, what color is your preacher's eyes? And the fellow said, you know, I don't really know. He said, I, I never have known. He said, fact, to tell you the truth, I never have seen his eyes. He said, you see, when he prays, he closes his eyes, and when he preaches, I close mine. <laughs> so uh, it, it's easy to go to sleep. And then I, I read not long ago that one of the ways to keep from growing old is taking frequent naps, especially if you take them when you're driving. And... and <laughs> Uh, but, it, but it won't help you to take them during church. So I hope that you will stay. And you don't have to worry about beating the Methodists to Bojangles because they're going to feed you here at church. So that means we're, we're not as nearly pressured for time. So, uh, I, at, oh, and I was going to ask, when he asked you who have heard me preach before, uh, the next question is, how many of you wish you'd have never heard me preach before? But I'm... <laughs> I'm not going to ask me to show hands of that, but I'm glad that you came back and we're looking forward to fellowship today and in a service tonight and tomorrow night. And I guess you already know uh, that the Bible says about Jesus coming back, that Jesus came and two were sleeping in the bed and one taking the other left and two's grinding at the mill and one taking the other left and two working in the field, one taking the other left. Came on Sunday night, two folks sitting at home watching TV and both of them left. And uh, so don't, don't stay home tonight and watch television. We'd love, to, we'd love to have you back in the service. And if, and if you know somebody who by their own profession is either backslidden or lost and not in fellowship with God and serving the Lord, do what you can to try to get them in these next two services and trust the Lord to, to bring some fruit out of it, you know, for His glory. Uh, meantime, would you bow for a moment and let's pray and ask Him from His Word and through His Spirit to minister to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your presence and for the power of your Word and for the work of His Spirit in our minds and our lives. We pray today that He will be free to do that for which He's been sent. And uh, that as we understand Your Word, if there's anybody here that's really not right with You, we pray that Your Spirit will convict of sin and put Your finger on things that need to be cleared up in their lives. And, and may this service today somebody make a decision that will determine their destiny in, in eternity. We thank you for the promise that you will bless your word as a priest and we claim that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham lived in the city of Ur, the land of the Chaldees. That city was not very far from where Baghdad now is. 
uh, on the Euphrates River. It was a large city. In fact, it was a, a very comfortable city. The, the uh, archaeologists who've uncovered its ruins say that they had uh, beautiful gardens with an irrigation system. They had water system. They had a sewage system. It was well defended. Wall. And in that comfortable and uh, convenient and well guarded, lived a man named Abraham. Uh, Hebrews chapter eight says, chapter eleven verse eight says, "By faith Abraham, when he was called of God to go out to a country where he should after receive her inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went." The next verse says, "By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country." Uh, dwelling in tabernacles and tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of him of the same promise. For he looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I remember from a boy, we grew cotton at home. We battled all year with the bow weevils over a, over a and if you've ever grown cotton, you know what I'm talking about. And out of that, there came this little saying, that the boll weevil am a little black bug come from Mexico, they say. He come all the way to Texas just looking for a place to stay, just looking for a home. He's just looking for a home. The first time I saw the boll weevil, he's sitting on a square. The next time I saw the boll weevil, he had all his family there. He's just looking for a home, looking for a home. The missus said to the master, now, isn't that a mess? That weevil has made a nest in my best Sunday dress. He's just looking for a home, looking for a home. And the master said to the missus, well, what do you think of that? He also made a nest in my best Sunday hat. He's just looking for Now, Abraham has something in common with the boll weevil. Uh, he spent his life traveling and looking, well, verse 10 says, for a better country. See, when Abraham went to leave and if his neighbors, he had to resign his job and uh, leave his friends, and leave his family. And I could just hear the, the fellow at the, at the company saying, well, uh, where are you going? And he said, well, I don't really know. He said, uh, how are you going to live? He said, well, I don't know that either. He said, well, when are you coming back? He said, well, I do know that. Never. I won't ever be back. And... Uh, he said, why? He said, well, God said to it. And uh, he said, I'm really leaving here looking for a better country. Uh, verse 10 says that he sojourned and recognized he was a stranger and a foreigner. And by faith, he kept going. He could have gone back, it says, but he kept going looking for a better country. Um, oh, and there is, there is a better country. And I guess at homecoming, that's the thing that our minds are, are probably occupied with, that somewhere there is a world that is better than this one. Um, if, if, the, if, there were, if there weren't a heaven, there ought to be one. We need one. Uh, this life is so short. It's so unfair. There's so many problems in it until there just needs to be somewhere where all the things that are made wrong here are made right. And 95% of the people on the earth believe that there's some place where people live after they die. Now, a lot of them got it all tangled up. For instance, the, the Muslims believe that every young man who dies in the service of his religion, that in heaven he'll have 350 women. And uh, I don't know what they think about 350 women make it heaven. Some of the men I know don't have a one. They're a long ways from being in heaven. Uh, but but uh, the concept is, may not be accurate, but they do believe there is such a place. And even folks who don't believe in the Bible, they don't claim to be Christians. They really aren't serving God. They don't go to church. Either. But when somebody dies, you will hear them say, well, he's gone to a better place. Now, he may not be going to a better place, but in their minds, there is a better place. And there is something deep in, in our hearts that makes us long for, expect, believe in some form of life after death. Uh, and there is such a place. 
Uh, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I prepare it, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. And that promise uh, is just, it has been fulfilled in that he has built and prepared a better. In fact, the next verse after that better country says that uh, God has been pleased to build for them a city. And that he is not be ashamed to meet with them and live with them in that city uh, and be their God. So there is the promise by God and the Lord Jesus that there is such a... And I was thinking of all the ways that that place is better than this country. Uh, In the first place, it's a whole lot better materially. Because the, the material world we're living in, living in, by the law of entropy, simply des, it, it, des, we design it and it destroys the designs. We construct it and it breaks down the construction and turns it back to its natural chaotic position. So that all, that's why it says Abraham was looking for a city that had foundations. It means he was looking for a city that foundations were eternal, that didn't crack, that didn't, because all the cities he knew, no matter how permanent they appeared, to be, none of it was permanent. See, you build yourself a house and the problem is nature will start breaking it down. The day you finish building it, you got to keep building it over again. You know, the next thing you know, you got to put a roof on it. Then you got, I, when we built our house, the, the uh, plumbing people said, well, you use uh, single faucet, uh, uh, single lever faucet fixtures. You don't have trouble with all the little washers. And so we put Delta single lever faucet fixture. And I found out that they were right. You don't have to replace the little washers. You have to replace the whole aggravating faucet. You know, the... <laughs> Uh, you, and you go to the plumbing supply and they said, well, we don't, we don't sell washers. We don't sell. The, the foundation under it was galvanized. It rusted and rotted and deteriorated. We had to put a whole new faucet in. You remember Jesus said, lay not yourself treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt. Amen. See, you're living in a world where moth and rust simply, you buy yourself a new car and the next thing you know, the rust is beginning to eat it up and after a long period of time, if you just left it, it would completely destroy it and, 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 and eat it up. The, the world we're living in, none of the structures that we put up are permanent or lasting. All of them, the very forces of nature, break them apart. And folks talk about saving the planet. I got a feeling the planet's going to save itself. It's going to recycle you, <laughs> you know, but it's, but it's going to save itself. And if the human race disappeared from this planet, in a few thousand years, I can assure you there would be a forest of trees growing right where this building is sitting and there's no evidence this building had ever been here. Uh, it, it will recycle what we construct and it will turn it back into the natural chaotic condition that it's been in. So one of the things about that, that world is it is a permanent eternal world. Whatever palace or mansion that there is there, it's not going to deteriorate. Uh, it's not going to rust. It's not going to rot down. Abraham was looking for a city that had permanency to it because none of them, and he looked for it in Egypt, couldn't find it. Looked for it through all the land of Canaan, couldn't find it. Uh, never stopped until Sarah died and he didn't have a place to bury her. So he went to his friends and said, I, I don't own any land, but I, I found a cave on the backside of the field of Machpelah and, and I want to bury my dead. And so he wept and left Sarah's body in the cave and he kept traveling until he died. And then Isaac brought him back and put him in the cave with Sarah. And that's the only land that Abraham ever owned was just a cemetery lot and a a grave because he kept wondering and kept looking uh, and saw himself as a stranger traveling through a foreign country because he had that better country in his mind. And it's not only better because it's permanent, like he was looking for, it's also a better place uh, morally than this, than this place is. Uh, the Bible says outside of that world are all of those, the murderers, the thieves. The, uh, and when Jesus said, lay your treasures up where thieves do not break through and steal. 
See, if you pick up my newspaper at home on any given day, there's one full page that's given to break-ins and thefts and, and armed robberies and murders. Uh, and the world's not only full of it in Chicago and San Francisco and my little town of Greenville. It is everywhere. Uh, and some of it is so tragic. Several years ago, there was a fellow, young man with his wife and a newborn baby stopped at a parking lot in a grocery store in our town. He went into the store to buy the groceries and she was changing the baby's diaper, staying in the uh, SUV that they had. A guy came and uh, kidnapped her, took her in that vehicle, took him outside of town. He tortured, raped her, and then beat her to death with the tire iron out of the car, left her dead body in the hot blazing sun in the field and a little crying baby living beside her. And they found her in time to, they saved the baby's life, but she was dead already. And I can tell you now, that kind of person won't be in that better country. Uh, there will be no heartaches from murder and stealing and, and, and uh, the troubles that are created by the folks who create those kind of, pro those kind of problems here. And in everybody's town and everybody's community, it, it exists everywhere because that's the way human beings are. And that's the way uh, the nature of man is. But the Bible says that None of that will enter into that city. All of that's left on the outside. It's going to be a morally perfect, righteous country. It'll be like God. And all the morality and righteousness of God will permeate that city. There'll be no need to keep your doors locked. There'll be no need of worrying about the, the trouble of a... Uh, of a rust corrupting of thieves breaking through and steal. Morally... It will be a much better country. And then physically, it will be a whole lot better country because not only does the things we construct deteriorate here, the bodies that we're living in deteriorate here. And uh, with all due respect to the folks who pray for the sick, and, uh, and I pray for the sick, and in most churches I go to, we have prayer meetings praying for the sick. Uh, but I can tell you, no matter how much you pray, no matter how many physicians you go to, you're going to get sick and die. And you can do all the praying that you like. You'll still die. Um, in, in fact, some of the dearest friends I've had over the years, as de the most dedicated uh, Gene Waddell and his wife were good friends of mine. Gene and I grew up together. And some of you remember he and I sang in a quartet all those years. It was Christmas in the early 60s. I was in Illinois when he called on the phone and he said, Bobby, I've just found out that Leah's going to die. She was uh, 29. I said, really? He said, the doctors say she'll live about a year. And for a year we watched her die had four little babies. Um, I guess she was prayed for as much as anybody I've ever known prayed for all over the country because folks who knew her. I had a revival meeting and stayed in their home in February before she died in April. Um, I don't know if you've ever had family prayer and, and got on your knees with four little babies. The oldest one was six years old. And they're crying and baby begging God, don't let mama die. To, to please, don't let mama die. She died anyway. You see, the truth is, no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you believe in God, you go to, people are going to get sick, they're never going to get well, and they're going to die. That's the way things are here. Um, I remember a little fellow that was born crippled. Um, and he didn't go to school. They had big braces on both his legs. Well, I drove a school bus once, and we helped him on the bus, helped him school a few times. He was, I guess, seven or eight years old. And when some of us got saved back in uh, 1950, in that, in that, in that fall, 
Old Roberts was in our part of the country. He came to Goldsboro in an airplane a hangar, and man, he was drawing five, six thousand people a night. To get into the place, you had to get there about four o'clock in the afternoon, because it was an exciting place. And the mama took uh, this little guy, and he, he went through the healing line twice, and uh, came home just like he went, with the same braces on him. But this time it was about four o'clock in the morning, and his brother came knocking at my door and said, she didn't know a preacher, but he said, Mama said she wants you to come quick because he's really sick. And when I got there, uh, she was sitting by the bed, and she had his body covered face and all with a sheet. So I, I knew he was probably dead, and I didn't know what to say. And while I was stumbling around looking for something to say, she stood and dried her tears on her apron, and she said, I wish you'd have been here about, about 15 minutes ago. She said, I was in the kitchen preparing this medicine, and he, real excited, calling for me, and she said, so I came running in here, and she said, he wanted me to set him up on the side of the bed, and I sat there beside him, and he said, she said, he was just so excited because he said, Mama, I just got a feeling that after all these years and all of our praying, God has, has finally heard our prayers and he's going to heal my legs and I'm going to be able to run and walk and play. And she said, he laid his head on my shoulder and he was dead. And I said, take the braces off. I wouldn't want to bury him in the braces because he hated the braces. And you say, why didn't God heal him? I don't know. Ask God when you see him. But I can tell you, there are crippled folks here that will never walk and they won't be healed here. But there's another world that's a better country. And there won't be any braces. There won't be any weeping babies over a mother who's dying with cancer. It'll be a world where immortal, incorruptible, eternal bodies will live forever with God and nobody will be sick and nobody will shed tears and nobody will die. Uh, it'll be a whole lot better country physically than what this one is. Oh, and then... Uh, It'll also be a better country spiritually. And by, by that I mean, well, in that 11th verse, when God said that, that I have built for them a city, a permanent dwelling place, and in that city I will not be ashamed to go live with them in that city and be identified as their God, and they will be identified as my children and my family. The great thing about it is we're going to be with God. And uh, you see, God loves me more than anybody on this earth has ever loved me. And God's easy to be with. People are hard to be with, but God's easy to be with. And uh, He's built a place, Jesus said, well, Jesus called it the Father's house. David called it the Lord's house. Um, Bible calls it heaven. It'll be like a family place where God is the Father, all of us as the children of God. So I guess, you know, it could be called our eternal home. Um, and uh, we will be in a special relationship with God beyond which we are. Now, now, you know, it's possible in this world to fellowship with God and to know God through Jesus, but there's still a separation between us and God. But in that country, there will not be. And, and we will be His children and we will finally be home. Uh, I know, you know, if, a, uh, if heaven is like my home, it's got, it's got to be a wonderful thing to pass through the experience of death and finally arrive in that e eternal world. Because what, you know, what makes for happiness, even in this life, it's not where you are. It's not what the house is like. It's who you're with. 
And you can be in the most terrible physical, you could be living up the Amazon River in the jungles of uh, South America somewhere. But if you were living with the right people, you could be very, very happy. You may be in the most elaborate, expensive hotel in this country, but if you're away from those right people, you can be very, very sad and be very lonely. And I know that from all the years that uh, I spent away from those right people. In fact, uh, we had a little house on Summit Street in Greenville. It had about 700 feet of floor space in it. It was made out of cinder blocks with stucco on the outside and plaster on the inside, blazing hot in the summertime and freezing cold in the wintertime. And, uh, and it, it just uh, the first place that we lived. And I would leave Jane and the boys there, and I'd go on. I closed a revival meeting one night in Albany, Georgia. And I was going to leave and go. I'd been away from home for, I don't know, six or eight weeks, a couple of months. And I was going to leave and go home the next morning early. Well, I tossed and tumbled and couldn't sleep at about 2 o'clock. I got out of bed, got my suitcase. I knocked on the door and said, Preacher, I'll see you down the road. I drove the rest of the night until about noon on Monday. And when I pulled up in front of that little cinder block house on Summit Street, there was a big banner all the way across the front of the house that said, Welcome Home, Daddy. And it, I, it didn't make any difference that it's just a little cinder block house. Uh, that's, that's where the people lived who loved me. That's where the people live that I was important to them. And that's where the most important people in the world lived uh, in my life. And when I get to heaven and that city that God has built, if there are no ivory palaces and no jasper walls and no cold, golden streets, if they're made out of asphalt and concrete block buildings. I don't think I'll ever notice. So I don't really care. That's where God is. And, and when I get to where God, and He loves me more than my mother who died when I was seven loved me, He loves me more than a wife that's loved me for almost 70 years. He loves me. He loves me so much he sent his son Jesus to suffer and die so I could live with him forever. I'm important to God. And when I am with God where he is, it'll be, it'll be a better country. It'll be heaven. Uh, it won't make any difference what the other circumstances are. We'll be eternally happy because we finally... See, when I was a boy growing up, my dad's a sharecropper, tenant farmer. We lived in one sharecropping shack right after another, moved very often, about every couple of years. Uh, in fact, we moved. We usually load everything we had on two two-horse wagons, and I thought we were going around the world. We was really just going two miles down the road and still moving to another shack. Uh, but we could put everything we had on those two wagons. You know, all the, the, the bedsteads and use the, even the chickens. A friend of mine said they moved so often in the fall of the year and went out to get the chickens. Chickens slide down across their legs so they could tie them. It's time to who's moving. I, 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 was, I was, didn't cooperate. You had to catch them, put them in a coop and take them. The cats, dogs and everything, we moved to another shack somewhere. And uh, I, I went visiting one weekend to a friend of mine, a landowner's son, big beautiful house. I remember as a little boy, we were about a mile from the school bus, where I got off the school bus, and I ran those last, that, that mile to get to that shack that was inhabited by bed bugs and, and flies and, and uh, lizards and anything else that was living there before we moved in. And I have thought since why it was, I was so happy being in that. So, see, you'd have been miserable if you'd have had to spend the night there. Uh, first place, the bed bugs to keep you awake all night. We, and, and you couldn't kill those great the little blood suckers would go under the buttons in those cotton mattresses and you couldn't get them out until DDT came along. Now, it may have polluted the entire earth, but it got rid of the bed bugs. 
uh, and uh, and the flies. You know, we we talk now. But we don't have flies now. We had flies then. Uh, we didn't have any screens. You know, didn't have some place didn't have any panes in the windows. It was just it was just flies. You reach for a piece of raisin pie, and all the raisins fly away. You fly that potato pie all along, uh, and and. Uh, and it, it's just hard to sleep at night because of bugs and, and the mosquitoes. You, you'd have been un, you would have been unhappy living there. But that's where the people lived. That to, to them I was important. And uh, that's my family. That's my home. When, when I get to heaven, it'll, it'll be my family. It'll be my home. And wonderful truth is, that all of you can make it to that better country because God, God, it's God's desire that we live with Him there forever. <laughs> Saddest thought I think I've ever had is somebody who's lived here with the miseries of this country and then they don't go to heaven when they die. I, I wish I were a universalist. I wish I could, I wish I could believe everybody would be in heaven because I don't know anybody that I've ever thought less enough of to, to, to hope that they wouldn't be in heaven. Um, and I, I, I hope you own your way to that better country, and I hope that you make it there. But you see, the city that he has built, one of the last things he said in the book of Revelation about that city, uh, he said that the, the way to enter that city is happy are those who have washed their robes for they have a right to enter the gates and to the tree of life and to go to the city. You see, when all of this is over and your life ends here and you try to get into that city that God has built for those who were strangers and foreigners while they're living here, there's going to be one question asked when you get to the gates of that city. Have you done your washing? Uh, so I've got to ask you now, are, are you on your way to the better country? If you die this afternoon and try to get into that city that God's prepared for those who are strangers in this world, um, have you come to Jesus? Have you washed the robe? so that when you approach the city, the one question, for, it's, it's not going to be a question of, of have you joined church and got baptized. It won't be the question of, of how well you treated your neighbor or mistreated. The one question, and folks, if there was any other way to get into that city and live with God, he would have spared Jesus the agony of dying on a cross. If you could get there by your good works or get there by religious observances, then Jesus would have never died on it. He, it evidently is the only way that God could justify you, forgive the sins, and allow you to live with Him forever was for Jesus to die and make a provision so that your sins could be forgiven. And you have to wash the robe if you're going to enter the city and live with God. Um, and so I look forward to the time whenever we'll be together as a family and, and that better country. And I hope that everybody here makes it home. I, uh, in fact, when I was growing up, I, I remember a, an old Merle Travis song. And I hadn't thought of it in years until Philip, our son, who's a musician in the church where he leads the music, he, he sang it about two or three months ago, and uh, it, it reminded me again of, uh, and, and I, I can't sing anymore, used to, you know, a little bit, but maybe, maybe I can talk my way through it, and you probably will remember some of the words. It went something like, I am a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world below, there is no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. 
He said he'd meet me when I come. I'm just a-going over Jordan. I'm just a-going over home. Their dark clouds will gather o'er me. I know the road is rough and steep, but golden fields lie out before me where God's redeemed their vigil keep. I'm going there to see my Savior. He said he'd meet me when I come. I'm just a-going over Jordan. I'm just a-going over home. Would you bow a moment? And between you and the Lord, honestly search your heart. And uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. There's a better place. There's a better country. Abraham looked for it, left the big city, went searching. And one day, he didn't find it in Canaan. He didn't find it in Egypt. But he found it when he went to be in your presence. Probably all of these people believe that there's a better place. And most of them understand that God has prepared that place for his people. If there's anybody here today who's uncertain about it, we pray that your spirit will open their hearts and minds and somewhere today they'll bow before you and do the washing and ask you to wash all the sins away in the blood that Jesus shed on a cross. And if they die tonight in their sleep, walk up to the gates of that city. The gatekeeper will say, let her in. She's washed the sins away in the blood of Jesus. She has a right to pass through this gate and to go to the tree of life and live forever with us in this city. We pray that nobody here, not one daddy's boy and a mom's girl and a mom or dad, would stand at the gate of that city and the, and the gatekeeper have to say, no, you don't have a right to dwell in this city. You haven't done your washing. We pray that your spirit will speak to their hearts and those who need to wash the room will do it now in Jesus' name.